Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And what an exciting story I'm reading. We're on part four now. And my word, Parker is having a very interesting time showing people around Dogwood Manor. I wonder if anything else is about to happen. So let's continue with our story. But before we do, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's continue with tonight's story. It must have been minutes later that a Bentley rolled down the driveway. I knew that whoever was in the fancy car had to be a serious buyer. At the time I had no idea what a sight for sore eyes I was. I had ripped the jacket on my suit as it had got entangled by some thorny barbs during my abrupt run through the woods and my shiny shoes were now covered in dust. The Bentley parked outside Dogwood Manor. The engine purred so gently as the car finally came to an abrupt stop. It was quite a contrast from the noisy car Dolly had left the property in only moments before. I stood outside the front door of Dogwood Manor, waiting for the couple in the car to make their appearance. The woman climbed out of the Bentley slowly, but she did so with so much grace, like that of a gazelle. Her brown, curious eyes fixed on Dogwood Manor. It was almost as if the woman was in an art gallery and her attention was fixated on one of the great works of art. I don't think she appeared to notice me. She was so caught up in her own world. The woman was wearing a zooty pair of Calvin Klein sunglasses. She was in her forties. She had long, dark brown hair tied away from her face in a ponytail. She was wearing some navy blue chinos red pumps, a red thin belt, and a black, white and red pinstripe shirt. Moments later, her husband soon climbed out of the driver's side door. He looked smart casual, extremely well presented. He was a tall man, although I doubt he was more than six foot, while his wife, by contrast, was much more petite. They both stood staring at the house together, and for a brief moment exchanged some inaudible words, which involved much head nodding. I could tell at once they were enchanted by Dogwood Manor. The woman began to sashay rather eagerly towards the front door. She swung her narrow hips backwards and forwards, moving with a purposeful, presumptuous but very graceful gait, almost as if she really was the new owner of Dogwood Manor. She appeared to have no reticence in her attitude, but wore an expression of expectation on her face that could only come from someone that was keen to buy a property like this. She looked every part the quintessential lady of the manor, and deep down inside my gut, somehow I knew unequivocally that she would be wearing that title in due course. She seemed to fit in this setting like the dogwoods and daffodils belonged to spring. That was when she appeared to notice me for the very first time. Her eyes swivelled around to meet mine, and then her gaze dropped down to study my bedraggled-looking suit, that had been subjected to an unfortunate run-in with some thorny barbs. That was when I realised what a sorry sight I looked, but it was too late to do anything about it now, to redeem the situation. It would have been a lot better if I'd removed the jacket I'd been wearing. Damn, I thought, when I considered my father's long-drawn-out lectures about appearances being absolutely everything in real estate. What kind of curb appeal did I bring to this grandiose mansion? when I looked as if I'd been having a love affair with a thornbush. Hello there, she called out, marching towards me. Me and my husband are here for your open day. We saw the sign outside on the road. Goodness gracious me, I'm so glad I saw it. We so nearly missed it. But thankfully I noticed the balloons blowing around in the wind rather wildly. This place is in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? like a best-kept secret that no one is allowed to know about. I can see why this place is an absolute treasure. If I lived here, I'd also want to hide it away. It ticks all my boxes. This is the house I've been looking for all my life, and I can't believe that I've found it today. Me and my husband, you know, we live in old Louisville, in an old, recently renovated Victorian 
I never wanted to move or live anywhere else until now. This house is actually giving me heart palpitations, in a good way, of course. I think I've fallen in love already. We have to look at this place. I hope you don't mind if we scoot around it and have a good look. Well, of course you can. Welcome to Dogwood Manor, I said in a professional, rather clipped tone of voice. Be my guest. You can look around the house unless you would prefer a chaperone. And if that is the case, I would be delighted to show you around. I've got some brochures I can give you, I said, handing the Sinclairs some pamphlets that they took from me gratefully. Lovely, said Mrs. Sinclair, opening up the glossy brochure approvingly to examine it. Her eyes twinkled with delight, like a kid looking at the doughnuts and offer in a bakery. So it's all here, is it? she asked me. All the information I might want to know about the house. Yes, all the details are included. From the asking price to the sizes of rooms, etc., etc. It tells you the entire layout of the property, including the woods, the ponds, the stable blocks, and so forth. Lovely! Oh, thank you so very much. And you must be the agent for this house, is that right? I was under the impression it was a Mr. Now, what is his name? You must forgive me. I'm so dreadfully bad with names. Ah, yes, it was Philip Wensleydale I was supposed to be seeing today. I'm very sorry, ma'am, but Philip Wensleydale is indisposed at the moment. And my father was supposed to be presenting Dogwood Manor on his behalf today. But he's also been called out on a family emergency at the very last minute. So he's asked me to chaperone people around Dogwood Manor. My name is Parker Vermicelli. I'm the son of Lawrence Vermicelli. So the man I spoke to was Philip Wensleydale, is that right? I spoke to him on the phone. He was the one that told me all about Dogwood Manor. That's right, it would have been Philip Wensleydale. He's the other agent that works with my father. Sadly, he's come down with appendicitis. Oh, poor, poor man. He has my deepest sympathies. I hope he makes a swift recovery. It's very good to meet you, Mrs. Sinclair, I said, shaking her hand politely. Likewise, it's very good to meet you, Parker, and it would be great if you would show me and my husband around this sprawling property. The question is, where do we start? I'm completely spoiled for choice. How about the drawing room? Shall we go in there first? I realised that these were the people my father had been telling me about, who would be likely to buy a house like Dogwood Manor, with just a flick of the fingers and with a nudge here and a wink there. Could I dare to hope I'd have a sale before the day was out? I could only cross my fingers and toes and pray a silent, earnest prayer that fate would smile down on me generously on this open day at Dogwood Manor. I could show my father then what I was made of. I delighted in envisaging his awed expression when I told him I'd made a sale while he was overseeing his sister at the hospital. When I look back all these years later... I realised that as a young teenager, I wanted nothing more in the entire world than to make my father proud of me. The true reality was that Dogwood Manor sold itself to the Sinclairs. Even if I'd been mucking out the stables and looked like something the cat had dragged in, I can honestly say without a shadow of doubt that nothing would have put off Mrs. Sinclair from buying Dogwood Manor. The way that woman was looking at the place, with eyes in attendance to every single detail, and with such an animated expression, as if she was all but a child caught up in a fairy tale. That was the look that she was wearing on her face the entire time. This house is absolutely gorgeous. There are no words. It's gorgeous. I never anticipated this in a million years. It's in marvellous condition. I mean, of course, Mr. Wensleydale told me all about the house. He said I would love it. But I never knew it required so little work. It's a big house, but it's still manageable. And that's incredibly appealing. Mr. Sinclair nodded his head in approval. I knew bringing my wife to Dogwood Manor would be a very, very unfortunate thing to do. I knew she'd want to buy it almost at once. He chuckled. 
Well, I just love houses of history, don't I? said Mrs. Sinclair. I am passionate, Parker, about old houses. They have so much charm and character, don't they? I can see this place is in first-class condition. And you know, just standing here, taking it all in, I'm taken straight back to the 1800s almost at once. I feel completely underdressed in this house, as if I should immediately put on a very glamorous gown. I can imagine the parties we could have in this place, Wiseman, she said, turning around to talk to her husband. This is such a desirable house to purchase. It's in apple pie condition, just how I like it. Oh dear, oh dear, didn't I tell you, Parker? Bringing my wife here was a classic mistake. I think she's in love with this place. Of course I'm in love with it, wise men. I really want to sell our place in old Louisville. I want to move in here right away. See, I told you, Parker. My wife would love nothing more than to be lady of the manor, chuckled Wiseman Sinclair. I can't say I'm surprised. I knew one day she'd find the house of her dreams. And when we drove up the driveway and I saw Dogwood Manor, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt we'd found that house. Does that mean a celebration is in order, I asked? Oh, absolutely said Mr. Sinclair. Show me the dotted line, and I will sign on it. I was not disappointed, as by the time my father returned from the hospital to affirm that my Aunt Ivy was going to be absolutely fine, there was a sale on the table from the Sinclairs. I dare say my father was impressed. He said to me, I think I should leave you to your own devices more often, son. Although how you managed to sell Dogwood Manor, looking that dishreveled, I honestly don't know. What on earth have you done to your jacket? It's all torn up. Oh, this, I said. I snagged it on some thorny briars. I decided not to tell my father what had really happened, and about my rather strange outlandish encounter with a Bigfoot. How did you manage to do that, son? He asked me. You're selling a house, not going for an intrepid adventure in the woods, are you? I shrugged my shoulders nonchalantly, and luckily my father did not press me for any information in regards to the matter. I think he was simply happy we had a sale on the table, and that the O'Reillys at long last had a cash buyer. After their very first open day, it certainly didn't get better than that. I was soon to learn that the Sinclairs had moved into Dogwood Manor at the earliest convenience and were absolutely thrilled with the property, and I couldn't blame them for that. It was a month later, after the sale for Dogwood Manor, that I discovered in my jacket pocket the key to the front door of the house. It was a beautiful key, and I knew that I needed to return it as soon as possible. Donald Sinclair, ten-year-old son of Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair, and twin brother Errol. I was ten years old at the time, with an identical twin brother called Errol. We'd been living at Dogwood Manor for an entire month, and me and my brother loved our brand new home, with its sprawling wood groves and feelings of endless space, which was a far cry from the renovated Victorian home we had lived in in old Louisville. One night my mother had put us to bed to read us a story. It was about half past six in the evening, and she insisted we had an early night, as she always did. I had been unable to get to sleep, but my brother Errol was already snoring. The moment he'd hit the pillow, he was out like a light, which was not unusual for him. I guess I was still adapting to the changes in our living arrangements. I lay there in bed, feeling bored and frustrated. I was struggling to find the sleep that eluded me. I stared up vacantly at the ornate ceiling above my head, as the night light on the landing tossed away the sinister dark shadows, so that me and my brother would not be too scared or intimidated to make trips to the toilet during the night. In my restless tossing and turning ordeal under the bedsheets, I soon became aware of the indignant voices coming from downstairs. One of the voices had a shrill edge over the other. It was obviously my mother's voice. I knew at once my parents were having a heated altercation. This was a first for them, 
as in truth they hardly ever so much as raised their voices to each other. My mother was quite a dominating character in our household, and what she said my father would genuinely go along with, just to keep the peace. My father was an easy-going, fun-loving person. He loathed confrontation and discord of any kind. So to a degree he would appease my mother, unless he really needed to put his foot down about something. I hurriedly climbed out of bed, wearing my cute blue flannel pyjamas. I ran over to my brother's bed and shook him as hard as I could. Wake up! Wake up, Beryl! Wake up! I think Mummy and Daddy are having a fight. My brother sat up sharply from his bed, wiping the sleep from his eyes. He looked somewhat bemused and rather disorientated. What's going on? he asked. Are you deaf, Errol? I told you that Mummy and Daddy are having a fight downstairs. My words got his prompt attention. It was rather like saying to him that it was snowing in an arid desert somewhere, as that was how rare fighting was between my parents. My brother's eyes grew wide with a curious intrigue. We both were hankering to know what it was that was causing my parents such conflict. We hastily put on our slippers and dressing gowns and gingerly trotted down the staircase as quietly as we could. The door of the library, which was opposite the staircase, was slightly ajar. A light was on on the inside, and me and my brother could hear the argument flaring through the open door like a frenzied wild wind. My mother's shrill voice was like a loud, piercing whistle, but what got me and Errol's attention was that the fight was about us. "'Wise men, I say we should send them to two different schools,' I heard my mother saying defiantly. "'I spoke to Donald's teacher, Mrs. Augustine. She's a lovely lady. She doesn't believe that Errol can shine because Donald is the dominant one of the two. She says he answers all the questions in class and always speaks up for Errol. She says that Errol shrinks into the background during class.' He becomes ambiguously obscure. I don't want that for our children, Wiseman. I want them both to shine like twinkling stars in their own unique way and to appreciate their own individuality. But that is not going to happen unless they're at different schools. That's what they need, Wiseman. They need to go to two different schools, don't you see? It makes perfect sense to me. I will have nothing of the kind like that happen. I want our children to shine as much as you do, darling. But sending them to two separate schools is absolutely ridiculous. And beyond that, it is completely impractical. Errol and Donald are as thick as two thieves. They will not appreciate being separated and being forced to go to different schools. You and I know very well that separating the twins is not an option. They would not be happy about that for a second. It's not about what they want, Wiseman. Nor is it about what we want. It's about what is best for the twins. You know what a dominant character Donald is. He can't help himself. He takes over everything. You mean he's like you? came my father's sarcastic voice. He likes to control things, is that what you're saying? Well, that's a maybe. I do admit that Donald takes after me. He's much more assertive than Errol is. But the point is that Errol is being crushed. Don't you see where I'm going with this? No, I don't see where you're going with this. Because Errol is not being crushed. Where are you getting this from? You're allowing that teacher, Mrs. Augustine, to feed you all kinds of weird ideas. You know that Errol is the quieter and the more demure of the two twins. He is reflectful and thoughtful. He doesn't talk a lot because he's a deep thinker. He likes the fact that Donald, his brother, is more outgoing than he is. Donald helps him to step out of his comfort zone when things get awkward. They're two individualistic personalities that complement each other. That is what I'm trying to tell you, Wiseman, and I wish you would get what I'm saying. How on earth is our Errol ever going to flourish in life with Donald being so dominant all the time? No, we need to split them up. It's the best idea all around as far as I'm concerned. 
When me and my brother heard what my parents were arguing about, we both knew my mother would win this argument, and that inevitably me and my brother would be split up. If you have ever been a twin, you will know that such an idea is absolutely nonsensical. Yes, it was true. I was much more outgoing than my brother Errol was. He was much more subservient and demure than me. I didn't make him hide his light under a bushel by any manner of means, as my mother claimed. My brother was reticent and bashful by nature, and attending another school without me at his side would have made him shrink further into his shell. Furthermore, my father was absolutely right. We would never be remotely happy if we were separated from each other. It was in that poignant moment that me and my brother Errol knew exactly what we had to do. We had no choice in the matter but to run away from Dogwood Manor, despite the fact that we had grown to love our new home. But for us, nothing was more worse in the entire world than being separated from each other. We thought we would go to my grandmother Ella's house, who was my father's mother. She lived in old Louisville, a few streets away from our old home. We would tell her what my mother intended to do to us. My grandmother did not remotely approve of some of my mother's choices in raising us. We often heard her express her extreme misgivings, especially when it came to any ideas of separating us, as she was strongly adverse to that, and believed that as twins we belonged together. She had made her opinions to my mother very clear. Me and my brother knew we could go to her, and have her on side, but the question was how did we get to old Louisville from here? If need be, we would move in with her. That was my thinking at the time. My brother, who was more practical than I was, looked up online, and although we realised it would be a long walk to Old Louisville, we found there were buses en route that we could take, once we walked to a certain point, that is, where we could finally get to Grandmother's house. We knew that our grandmother would protect us from our mother's insane idea about splitting us up and make us go to two separate schools. We could not allow that to happen by any manner of means. We have to go to Grandma's house. We're going to have to live with her now. We have to leave Dogwood Manor, I told my brother. You know what Mummy's like. She'll separate us. She always wins all her arguments with Daddy. Daddy will let her do what she wants and we'll be forced to be apart. She'll split us up. I know she will. We have to go to Granny's. It's our only choice. My brother nodded in agreement. We have to go. I can't go to school without you, Donald. And you won't have to, because no one is ever going to split us up. And that's a promise. Cross my heart. Hope to die if I tell a lie. Of course, I was very sad to leave Dogwood Manor and the fabulous home that we'd lived in for an entire month. But me and my brother Errol knew very well we had no choice, but we had to leave. So while my parents argued among ourselves, we hurriedly got dressed into jeans and sweaters. We took a couple of flashlights with us for our intrepid journey, some pocket money we'd saved up for our bus rides, and a few snacks from the refrigerator that we might need. We put those in a duffel bag, and we quietly slunk out of the house like two furtive burglars, without my parents being any the wiser. We slipped through a patio door on the wraparound porch, where we trailed through the front yard. I do recall their arguing continued as we left. I heard my father say, Let's see what my mother has to say about this. She does not believe in our children being separated. She says our twins belong together. Your mother does not know what's best for our children, Wiseman. I assure you, Mrs. Augustine knows exactly what she's talking about. She's had lots of experience with children over the years. I think being separated will do them both the world of good. At ten years old, walking through the trees in the middle of the night was certainly a daunting prospect for the both of us. We gingerly followed the long, winding driveway. It was so tenebrific that I was beginning to feel rather scared. But I was resolutely determined not to show Errol how unhinged I really felt. Maybe we should have slipped out at first light, as walking around in the darkness was not the wisest decision, but it was too late now to backtrack on our decision. We were out of the house now, and going back didn't seem like a great idea. If we were to return to our beds, 
we would not be able to get a wink of sleep, so we might as well make tracks now and get to my grandmother's house as soon as we possibly could. I certainly didn't want to stay in the grand mansion. Knowing what my mother was planning for the both of us, the thought made me sick to my stomach. I was already feeling wretchedly nauseous. I wanted to throw up the contents of my stomach, but I fought against those physical urges. Me and Errol were feeling incredibly aggrieved over my parents' conversation, and that drove us further forward. As being ten-year-old kids, we both very well knew that we would have no say in regards to the matter. I'm really scared, said my brother Errol. I think we should go back, but I don't want to go back, but I want to go back, because I don't like it. It's so dark out here. I can't see anything. Do you want Mummy to separate us? I asked my brother. Do you want to go to school without me? Because if we stay at Dogwood Manor, that's what's going to happen. Mum will win her argument. She always does, and we'll be split up. Do you want that, Errol? Of course I don't want it. Well, then we need to get to Grandma's house as soon as we can. Granny won't separate us. We can live with her. But can't we leave first thing in the morning? When it gets light, my brother asked me, we don't want mum and dad to see us, do we? We can use the darkness to get ahead. They will be asleep in bed. We have a head start. And if we go back, we won't even be able to sleep anyway, because we'll be worrying about going away, about running away. And what if our parents see us do that? We can't let that happen. If we go now, they won't have any idea what we're up to. But it's so dark, and I'm so scared. It was as we scrambled through the tall, lofty trees of the woodgrove to take a quick shortcut through the woods to get to a main road that strange things began to happen, things we couldn't explain. We were guided by the light of our torch and suddenly realised that something or someone was following us. But who? We walked down the path with our hearts thundering in our chests. We heard twigs breaking and snapping. It scared us half to death because we weren't making that sound. My only thought was that we needed to get to the road as quickly as we possibly could. I felt that we would be safer on the road. We began to scuttle rather precariously down the earthen paths over the debris of fallen leaf litter like two blind dung beetles, not really knowing where we were going. I wanted to sing Hallelujah when we finally reached the road. That was when we both saw her. I had never anticipated such a bizarre outlandish encounter like this. The creature was robustly built, like a formidable army tank. She was large as she was wide, with ponderous shoulders. She had a distinctive bullet-shaped head and a face that was startlingly human. I knew I was seeing a Bigfoot. I was absolutely terrified, as everything about this imposing creature made me aware of how inconspicuously small I was by contrast. I felt like an ant in the presence of an elephant. The creature's eyes were giving off an intimidating yellow eye shine. I was scared to look into those eyes, in case she saw my stares as a threat. I had heard bad stories about Bigfoot encounters before and this creature seemed to be very interested in us, and her curiosity over us scared me half to death. What did she want with us, I wondered. I kept hearing in my head, Where are you going? You mustn't go away. It's not safe. I didn't know where the strange voice was coming from, but it was not my own. But I knew that me and my brother needed to get away from this creature, but I didn't fancy our chances of escaping her. She was so powerful. She looked like she could easily outrun a seasoned athlete. It was possibly about nine o'clock at night or thereabouts. There might be an occasional car, if we were lucky, driving down this road, although it was usually pretty sequestered, but we could live in hope. If that happened, we could stop the car, ask for help, and hopefully escape the Bigfoot. It's a Bigfoot! I cried out to my brother. Run! Run! We began to run down the road. The Bigfoot began to give us chase and was gaining ground on us. I kept hearing in my head, Stop! Come back! I'm not going to hurt you! 
At this point in time, my heart was pounding violently in my chest, my whole body trembling like a jelly. I heard a voice screaming in my head again, Please stop! All of a sudden, I saw a car driving down the road. It was like a gift from God. The Bigfoot turned around and ran towards some trees, where she took cover behind one of them and watched us. I began to wave madly. I was so afraid the Bigfoot might hurt us and come after us because she was so big. The car was our hope of certain escape. The car looked like a four-wheel drive vehicle. It promptly stopped, and I felt huge relief. The young man in the car wound down his window and said, Are you kids all right? It's nine o'clock at night. What are you doing wandering around on the road like this? Get into the car. I'll take you home. Where do you live? We live at Dogwood Manor. It's not far from here, I told the young man. I can show you where to go. We both gratefully climbed into the car seat beside him. Suddenly I felt rather safe. Going home seemed like a good idea. I nervously looked over my shoulders while sitting in the car towards the woods to see if I could observe the female Bigfoot. I was hoping she was long gone, but she was still there, standing behind a tree, watching us. I heard a voice in my head saying, Don't do that again. I've got better things to do with my time than run after naughty children. Make sure you go home. I was rather confused because I suddenly realised that the female Bigfoot was talking to me. I watched her turning around and gliding back into the woods and I realised then and there that she didn't impose a threat to us at all. She had been watching over us, worried about us because we'd been running away from home. You say you're from Dogwood Manor. How extraordinary. It's a small world because that's where I'm going right now. You must both be the Sinclair twins. We are the Sinclair twins, but why are you going to Dogwood Manor at this late time of night? My mother never receives late visitors. Well, it's a long story, I'm afraid. My name is Parker Vermicelli. My father's name is Lawrence Vermicelli. He sells real estate for a living. But on the day your parents both came to view Dogwood Manor a few weeks ago... I had the pleasure of selling the place to them. My father was otherwise indisposed at the time. The other day when I sent my suit off to be repaired, I discovered that I still had the front door key to Dogwood Manor in my pocket. And it's no ordinary key. It has been beautifully handcrafted. They don't make keys like this any more, so I knew I needed to return it to your parents forthwith. I phoned your mother this afternoon and told her I'd be passing this way a little later in the evening, and did she mind if I dropped off the key then? She said it would be absolutely fine, and then by lucky chance I run into the both of you. Are you going to tell me what you're doing on the road in the middle of the night? Are you running away from home? We are running away from home. Please don't take us back there, sir. Can you drop us off at our grandmother? She lives in the old Louisville area. It would be better if you dropped us off there. Would you mind dreadfully doing that? We would really appreciate it, sir. But why would you want me to do that? My mother wants to separate the both of us. We're twins and we don't want to be separated. She wants to send us to two different schools. And we don't want that. Of course you don't want that. I understand you both want to run away. I did at one point when I was your age, so I understand where you're coming from. But why would you want to do that? You'll only cause your parents great distress. They'll be wondering where you are. My mother wants to separate us. We're twins. She wants to send us to different schools. We don't want that, sir. Of course you don't want that. I tell you what, I'll talk to your mother for you. My father was a twin. His parents tried to separate the both of them, and it was a catastrophic mistake. How about I take you back to Dogwood Manor, and I'll speak to your mother for you about this matter. But how do you know she'll listen to you, sir? She always wins her arguments with my father. She always gets her way in absolutely everything. I will speak to her, 
because I know exactly what happens when you split up, twins. It's not a good idea. I promise I'll speak to your mother. I'll do my best to persuade her to keep you two together. I do not remember all the details of that night when Mr. Vermicelli dropped us off at home. My mother was mortified that me and my brother had tried to run away. When she learnt that Mr. Vermicelli had seen us on the road and had waved him down because we were so afraid, we even told her about the Bigfoot that had followed us when we left the property, but my mother didn't believe a word of it. For goodness sake, don't be so ridiculous. There is no such thing as Bigfoot. Your imagination is playing tricks on you. But you brought this on yourself, wandering around in the dark in the middle of the night like that. What on earth were you thinking? On hearing my conversation with my mother, Mr. Vermicelli took me to one side very discreetly, when my mother didn't appear to notice, and whispered in my ear, I believe you about the Bigfoot you encountered, but don't you worry about the creature. She will definitely not hurt you. I've seen her myself on this property, playing with a little girl. She may look intimidating and scary, but believe me, she's very nice. She was probably rather worried about you, running off in the middle of the night the way you did. I know, sir. She told me in her head a similar thing, actually. There you go, then, said Mr. Vermicelli, looking pleased. My mother, on the other hand, was not remotely pleased with me, or with our insubordinate behaviour. While my father was wearing a rather smug I-told-you-so look on his face. I don't understand why the two of you would run off like that, Donald, my mother cried out indignantly, focusing the blame entirely on me, like she always did. She believed I led my brother Errol astray with my wild, fanciful ideas. And in truth, I probably did. Why would you do such a silly thing, running off like that? You're very lucky that Mr. Vermicelli here saw you in the road and brought you safely back here. Me and your father thought you were fast asleep in bed, the both of you. And all the time, you were running away from home. I thought you liked it here at Dogwood Manor. I like it here, Mum. But I don't want you to split me and Errol up. I heard you say that you'd send us to separate schools, and you can't do that to us. We were going to live with Granny, because she'd never send us to separate schools. Me and Errol want to be together. So that's why you ran away, is it? asked my mother. You overheard me and your father talking about this matter together. So that's what this is all about. I told you, love said my father Lawrence. This wild idea of splitting up our children and sending them to separate schools is never going to work. It's not practical either. Look at the way they ran away from home tonight. Based on what you were suggesting, it was a preposterous idea from the very beginning and you know it and I know it. Take it from me, Mrs Sinclair, said Mr Vermicelli. I don't wish to intrude. But I want to speak on your children's behalf, if I may. I do believe they will run away from home again, if you try to separate them. I speak from experience, you see. My father and his brother were identical twins, and my father's mother had similar bright ideas about splitting them up. They were always repetitively running away from home, until my parents promptly decided to keep them together. It was the best decision they could have made. You would be wise to do the very same thing. Oh dear, it looks as if I've really been put in my place, said my mother looking quite put out by the whole affair, while my father looked like the cat who'd got all the cream. I'm glad to say that my mother listened to Mr Vermicelli, and me and my brother were never split up during our childhood. And although I never saw the female Bigfoot again, I know that if we had attempted to run away from home, we probably would have seen her, as throughout my childhood, when we played out of doors, especially in the woodgrove, I always knew the Bigfoot was watching over us. Me and my brother would always sense her presence. So there you are. That's my story. What an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.